going to talk about the origins and lineage of abdominal therapy. I thought it was interesting this morning that I checked the definition of lineage and it's a group or a family comes from a single ancestor. So actually we have two ancestors. Next slide. So uh, Central America, this is where I have lived for the last uh, 50 years of my life. I started uh, my sojourns out of the United States as a result of the Vietnam War. My boyfriend at the time was a draft dodger. And one day he said to me, baby, if we don't get out of this country, I'll be dead or in jail within two years. And that's not a very bright future for a young man. So we left our uh, Northern California commune, a Black Bear Ranch, and took a bus to Mexico where uh, he had a previous contact who was a friend. So we lived in Guerrero, Mexico for seven years from Guerrero, Mexico, I came to Belize alone and pregnant. My daughter was born in Belize in 1977. And uh, you're looking at the map of the Maya world. Don Eligio was born just uh, west of Belize in the area of Guatemala known as the Peten. I think you can see where Tikal is if you come oh, about an inch down, that's where Don Eligio was born and raised by that lake. That is Lake Peten Itza. And Don Eligio was born in one of the villages around that lake. He came to Belize in a rebozo wrapped up in his mother's shawl just before he was two years old um, because his father was an infamous necromancer, a person who did evil spells on others for money. So he had to leave his village of San Andres in Peten, Guatemala, because the, uh, the officials were after him from having harmed so many people. So Don Eligio and his mother and father walked from that lake to Belize in 1898. 18, no, it would have been 1893, 1895. They walked into what was then known as the Colonia. Okay, the next slide. So we also always have to always include our patrona, our patron, Ischel, the Maya goddess of healing, medicine, the moon, the earth, all bodies of water and weaving and fertility and childbirth. Like us women, she has a very large portfolio, a lot to accomplish in the heavens with the Maya spirits. She is one of Don Eligio's benevolent nine Maya spirits. Los, los, my, los espíritus benefico de los Mayas. It was always, that was the phrase that I heard many, many times in my apprenticeship. So you're all familiar with the maiden, the mother, and the elder. And those are the three phases of our beloved goddess, Ischel. Next one. All right. We have two ancestors in our lineage, Don Eligio Panti, born in 1893 in Peten, Guatemala, passed away in 1996 at the age of 103. This photo was taken by Michael Ballack of the New York Botanical Garden, and it's always one of our favorites. He's pointing to the sky in answer to the question, who was your teacher? Meaning God was my teacher. And one of the most impressive thing about Hortense and Don Eligio was that much of their learning, much of their wisdom actually did come through dream visions. I feel that both of these people were intuitive geniuses. Ms. Hortense was born in 1928 in Cozumel Island, the ancient sanctuary for women of Ischel. That was a very, very active pilgrimage site for all women of the Maya lands up until the 1700s. Of course, after the, um, the Spanish conquest, all of those religious sites were dampened down and people 
were not allowed under threat of death to attend any spiritual, sacred, or religious ceremony. But Miss Hortense, I always thought that was so fascinating that she, descendant from a lineage of midwives, as a Belizean, was born on Cozumel Island, and she grew up and uh, grew into her mature years as the most famous of all the herbal midwives of Belize. So as I said, these are intuitive geniuses. Neither one went to school, neither one ever learned to read or write, yet they were absolutely brilliant geniuses. And not having had the dubious benefit of learning with, with um, words and books means that we were able to, to be the recipient of some truly authentic ancient wisdom and knowledge. So this is our lineage, our ancestors, Don Eligio Panti and Miss Hortense Robinson. Next. <clears throat> I love this uh, picture on the top. Um, my husband took this photo. This is the very first day that I made my sojourn on foot to visit Don Eligio in his clinic. It was a week after he had come to see, my, see me in my clinic in San Ignacio town in Western Belize. He had heard that there was a herbal, that, that there was a herbalist from the United States now living in San Ignacio. And he came to ask for some flor de tilo, which is linden flower tea. He said it was the only thing that could help him sleep since he had lost his wife only three years earlier. Well, linden flower happens to be one of my very favorite teas. It's a wonderful sedative for the elderly, the very young, even babies. So it was one of the dozen herbs that I brought with me from Chicago when we came to settle on this little piece of land in Belize. So I gave him a little bag of the linden flower tea. He was very grateful. I gave him a short treatment on the massage table and I asked if I could come visit him in his village next week. And he said, si, te puede. Right there I will be neither more nor less than you see right now. And so this is taken from across the river, looking at our two thatch huts, which at the time that was the full extent of East Chow Farm. In the middle of the two huts, you can still see our water tank, which we pumped up from the river and under there, we took our showers. That picture of me and Don Eligio was probably in 1988 or 1989, and that was taken inside his clinic. So in 1996, yes, 1996, I published Sastun, my apprenticeship with a Maya healer. I had no idea that Don Eligio was a shaman when I first went to study with him. I only knew that he was Belize's most renowned herbalist. And that was my only interest to learn the medicinal plants of my new new home that I could include in my practice as a doctor of nephropathy. Over a year or two, it becomes very clear to me that Don Eligio is not only a herbalist, but he is what referred to in ancient days as the Hemen, H apostrophe N E N, which means he or she who knows. What made Don Eligio the Hemen is because he had the Sastun, Sastun translates best and most simply as crystal ball. So sas means light or mirror and tun means stone or age. So sastun as a crystal ball is a mirror of the ages or a reflecting translucent stone, which is used for divination. So Maya healers since ancient times have been famous for their possession of the Sastun, which is a stone of enchantment and divination. Okay, next slide. Here uh, again, Michael Ballack took this photograph. When I realized that Don Eligio was the recipient of the last threads of the Maya 
medical system, which included spiritual healing, contact with the Maya spirits, using the Sastun for enchantment and divination, I became very overwhelmed. What am I supposed to do with this? How do I to record this. Should I record it? This seemed to me like a body of knowledge and wisdom that was about to be lost with this wonderful old healer who was 90 when I met him. So I set about writing to various different uh, botanists, ethnobotanists, and scientists of anthropology. I wrote probably 50 letters explaining who I was and about this wonderful old traditional healer that I had met in Belize, and there seems to be a lot more than herbology here, and I really don't know what to do, so can you please help me? The only one who answered affirmatively was Michael Ballack. Michael Ballack came to our doorstep in 1986, and he was the one who set about to produce the Belize Ethnobotany Project so that all of Don Eligio's medicinal plants could be recorded for posterity, for the Belizean people, for the Belizean government, and basically for the world and for the Maya people. So this photograph was taken on the day that Michael accompanied, accompanied Don Eligio and I into the forest to collect medicinal plants for his clinic. You see the little sack on his back that is hanging from his forehead. That was always the traditional method of carrying burdens. And of course, it left your hands free, which was important. I am I'm carrying a, a sack that is containing the herbs that we are collecting, the fresh leaves that we collected every day for the herbal baths for his patients. And I'm also carrying the pick. So next slide. This is a wonderful photograph. Again, Michael Ballack took this photo of Don Eligio and I deep, deep, deep in the jungles above San Antonio village in Western Belize. On the same day he took the previous photo, Don Eligio was always on the search for this marvelous plant that he knew as Zorio. Zorio translates best as skunk root. It's Chio Coca Alba. It only grows in the very deep, high rainforest. You don't ever find it in the lowlands close to the river. So this was the day that I accompanied him, and he was utterly astounded that it is the, was the largest skunk root vine and plant he had ever found in 50 years of collecting on the same hillside. And he said to me, you see, this is the largest skunk root I have ever found in my entire life, my whole career as a healer. And that's because Ischel blesses the herb collector if he walks in the jungle with a woman. First time I heard Ischel's name and I so remember clearly saying, who is Ischel? And he told me the story of the Maya goddess of medicine and how she is the one who looks after the plants the healing and also the healers. So um, this particular vine was seven days of four hours a day to get all of it out of the earth. And he was absolutely thrilled. And that amount of vine probably lasted him two months. So it's the root that we would carry home to chop up for medicine, and this was medicine for people who were suffering from spiritual diseases. Not, not ever often, rarely ever used for a physical ailment, but always for a spiritual ailment, in particular something like envy, where people get uh, envy as a spiritual disease from if they live or work with someone who every day looks upon their life with envy and jealousy. It's a whole syndrome within the Maya medical system that is covered at length in our week-long spiritual healing class. So we won't go into great depth, but just to say that this plant was a specific for spiritual diseases of the Maya. There's my machete, because everywhere I go to talk about my experience with Don Eligio, people invariably ask, do you really have a machete? 
Well, there's the photograph that proves I do have and I do use a machete. All right, next one. This, this is Don Eligio's healer's hut. This is where he chopped medicine. This is where his patients could live while they were getting their um, therapies. Sometimes it wasn't as simple as take this bag of tea home, come back in 10 days. Often people were so sick or in so much need that Don Eligio decided they should stay with him for three or four days so he can do the healing work consecutively. This is the little hut that was about 50 years old when I first met him. And if you look at the very top of the roof, you can see how it was already a tumble down thatch hut that was leaking in all corners. And the next one. And here we see Don Eligio's whole compound. And please notice that is the road. That is not a little path through the jungle. That is a major artery in Belize on the way to the Pine Ridge. It is also the road that is used by the loggers and all of those who go up to visit the ancient Maya ruins. And that's the road that I would walk five miles from my farm to Don Eligio's village once a week for 13 years. And every week I spent and slept three nights and four days in Don Eligio's little cement house. He hung up a hammock for me. So I always like to think this is like the, the uh, place of the three little pigs. There's a house of stone, a house of straw, and a house of sticks. The cement house is where Don Eligio lived. And I guess that that little house was nine by 12, one room divided into two rooms. One room was his clinic, the other room was where he slept. And this one in the foreground, that is where his uh, patients could sleep as well. And also where he stored a lot of his herbs. And the one behind me is the kitchen. And uh, that kitchen was uh, used by his wife who had only passed away five years earlier when this photo was taken. So there we have Don Eligio's little compound in San Antonio. You can see the Maya mountains behind it. And as I said, this is five miles by road if I cross the river from my little East Chell farm. If I did not cross the river, it was a 35 mile trip. So I would cross the river on foot, get on that road and walk the five miles to Don Eligio's compound. Next. This is Don Eligio's clinic. This is his nine by 12 house of two rooms. And uh, that little chair you see on the lower right-hand side of the photograph is where all of his patients would sit. And he would say, where did you come from? I came from Peten in Guatemala. Well, what is your sickness? They would tell him his sickness. And if he was not sure if this sickness was physical or spiritual, you look on the table and you see the little clay jar that's holding his sastum. He would consult with the Sastum to find out if this is a physical disease or is this a spiritual disease. And the Sastum would answer with yes or no. And that little seat is also where I always took my lunch with Don Eligio for that entire period of 13 years. Next. So I was very impressed, of course, with Don Eligio's entire practice, very busy. He saw about 100 clients a week, but two things impressed me the most was the abdominal massage that he did on all patients with reproductive disorders or digestive disorders. And then the other, to me, most impressive aspect of his work was the spiritual healing. Here he is saying, prayers for an infant who had susto. Uh, in this case, I believe, if I remember correctly, the, suit, the uh, child witnessed a domestic battle between the mother and the father and had not stopped crying and had not slept more than five minutes in two weeks. So they brought the baby to Don Eligio, who said a series of nine prayers, gave the mother a bag of leaves that she would take home and bathe the baby 
for nine days in a row. And the mother came back about 10 days later and said that she meant to give the baby all the baths, but by the third bath, he was sleeping like a baby. That seemed like the susto was gone after only three baths. So that is why I decided to include the spiritual healing training in our overview of my uh, medicine and the abdominal therapy. It's such an important part of who we are and what we do. Uh, prayers for infants, prayers for children, and prayers for people suffering from fright, grief, envy, and many, many others that you would learn about in the spiritual healing. Okay, next. I love this photograph. This is my favorite because you see what a beautiful Maya profile Don Eligio had. It always reminds me of those etchings in stone of the ancient Maya. And this is his great granddaughter and that entire family lived right next door to his compound. And when after Don Eligio's wife died, they took very good care of their grandfather. Next. And Miss Hortense, this is a photograph, a rare one of Miss Hortense uh, in class. Miss Hortense came with me to all of our classes for about seven years. She had uh, only ever been to uh, Mexico and Belize, and it was her first time ever to be invited to the United States. So I traveled with her for seven years doing our workshops. This is in Massachusetts at the old round house in the early, early days. And Ms. Hortense is demonstrating how to tie and how to use a faja. And in those early days, we had, <coughs> sorry, we had an idea. You see the little orange thing under the lady's hand? I was sewing half moon, half moon designs that were stuffed with cotton so that a person could put that that stuffed half moon on the uh, pelvis where the uterus was lying improperly. It never worked because that half moon would fall out when you were walking around, fell into the toilet when you went to go to the bathroom. So we gave up on that very early. But um, here Ms. Hortense is uh, demonstrating to the group who had never seen a faja before and so I guess that I learned about the Faha from Ms. Hortense in the 1990s. Um, Ms. Hortense, as you know, was a, a herbal midwife, and this was part of her de rigueur treatment for all of her clients. Everybody got a Faha. She never made them, but people came with Fajas. That's something that always impressed me as well when I watched Ms. Hortense or Don Eligio do the abdominal massage for women with reproductive disorders, always they took off their faja before they lay down to get their treatment. So I felt that that was really fascinating that every woman knew and understand, not understood if I have a problem in my uterus or ovaries, I need to be wearing a faja. Okay, next slide. And <clears throat> Part of our um, outreach to the community involves a number of different projects and programs. Here, uh, we hosted, Ischia hosted uh, one of the very first traditional healers conferences in Belize. There were a series of 12. This one took place in San Ignacio. This was an opportunity for healers from all over the country, especially when the conference was in Belize City People could come from all over the country, and our motto was, if you want to learn, if you come, if you want to learn, come to share if you know. So it was an open invitation for healers to come and share their knowledge with each other. And this is a uh, Maya man from Don Eligio's village of San Antonio, sharing about his favorite therapy and his favorite plant. There's Miss Juana. Some of you may remember Miss Juana is, was a uh, herbal healer and midwife in Sukut's village, very close to me. And there is a man who at the time was working for, for me, Don Bernardino from San Antonio. He was a bone setter. 
So if you had a, a sprained ankle or a bone out of place, that was his particular expertise. So the next slides that I'm going to show you are demonstrating how we at East Gel Tropical Research, Research Foundation use the funds that your students and you donate from all of the teaching that we do around the world. Next. So one of the outreach that we do is I like to, well, whenever I can, go to Guatemala, Nicaragua, other parts of Central America and do our workshops for midwives. So this one was organized by uh, a friend of mine who's a medical doctor in Playa del Carmen. And this hut was built for the purpose to do this um, midwifery workshop. It was a five day workshop. Janelle Miller was my assistant. She's a midwife who is fluent in Spanish, but it was wonderful to have her at my side. 12 midwives attended this workshop and uh, I certainly hope that it had a major diff made a major difference and had a major influence on so many lives that they were able to touch. They came from various parts of Yucatan. There's our, our uh, treatment table right there that that young lady is sitting on. So this is one of my, my favorite things to do is to bring our work back to the indigenous communities. This is only one of those workshops. I also have done them in Guatemala, other parts of Mexico as well, especially Yucatan and Guanajuato. Next. This is in the very early uh, days. I am in Southern Belize amongst the Quechi Maya. Now the Quechi Maya are said to be the true indigenous people of Belize. The Mopan Maya, who Don Eligio represents, came pretty late in the picture from Guatemala. The Yucatec Maya came in the 1900s from Yucatan, Mexico. This is a group of Quechi Maya women in the area of Belize known as Punta Gorda. And I am there for the weekend giving classes on medicinal plants and traditional healing. We are actually in one of the cabins that Ischel built for the community so that they would be able to engender some tourism income through people spending time in the Maya community so that they would eat um, with the Maya people, they would go to the fields with the Maya people and just have a village experience, but they had no housing. So Ischel contributed a great uh, portion of the building of this little cabin with uh, four bunk beds, a table, and a couple of chairs in the village of Laguna in southern Belize. And uh, there is the um, little booklet that I handed out with pictures and the explanations of the medicinal plant. There are actually about 45 or 50 women in this room, and the gentleman in the back. He asked me to give this specific class in the evening. He is the traditional healer of this village. And he said that his reputation was no longer stellar because people were losing faith in their medicinal plants and traditional healing. So he invited me to come and do this workshop in a way we both hoped that would boost his standing in the community. And it did. This is a workshop in Guanajuato, Mexico. This had 60 women from small villages surrounding San Miguel de Allende. And here I taught a three-day workshop on the abdominal massage and medicinal plants. I focused mostly on the self-care work for these women. And then we did a short full day session on how to do this for clientele as well. Most of these are midwives. Some of them just came along like the children everywhere in Mexico where there are women, there are children because they usually don't leave their kids when they have to go to a workshop. Children just come along, everybody knows it and everybody expects it. So the oldest person you see right there with the uh, black sweater and the white blouse, like five or six, 
from the right going in. She was the oldest member of that group and had been a midwife in Guanajuato, much like Ms. Hortense, for the last 55 years. So she was the, um, the spokesperson for the group. And I think everybody took it really, really well. The, what I thought was um, disturbing and kind of sad is that it was almost forgotten. The elder woman there was the only one who used it in her practice as a midwife. The other said that the medical doctors told them not to do it because it's too dangerous and you will hurt people. And even while I was there during this time, I actually heard announcements on the radio from the medical professionals warning people against abdominal massage that it was too dangerous, don't do it, they'll hurt you. So this was an opportunity for us to get together and share the safe protocol, share the safe guidelines and why sometimes it might be dangerous, why sometimes it might be painful, how to avoid that. So it was a great opportunity for us to be the voice of wisdom again for these traditional people. Next. And one of our uh, major um, projects is our summer bush medicine camp for children. Children age nine to 12, it is only open to children in Belize. And uh, every year we get very sincere requests from people who would love to send their children to Belize for a camp on medicinal plants. We only did it once and would never do it again. The reason is that these children are almost all from poor families. When they come to Bush Medicine Camp, we have to provide them with shoes. We have to give them toothbrushes. We have to give them soap. And their families are just not able to provide what we think of as very basics. An American child shows up wearing a $200 pair of sneakers and with uh, camping equipment that looks like he's going to Africa. And then also uh, these children speak in English Creole. American children do not understand English Creole. So we found that the uh, American children were isolated and the Belizean children felt diminished. So it's only open to Belizeans and we find the age nine to 12 is perfect. And what we do is teach them about the importance of conservation of medicinal plants and preservation of traditional healing. And we try to have as much fun with song and dance, canoeing and horseback riding in between. Next. So Summer Bush Medicine Camp came about as a result of a dream on the very night that Don Eligio passed away. We had left him in his village. My husband and I went to collect him at the local hospital where his grandchildren had brought him after a stroke. And the doctor said, take your grandfather home. He is basically brain dead and there's nothing we can do for him. Let him go home and die in his own bed. So we carried him home in our vehicle with Don Eligio's head on my lap, chuggling all the way back over the rough road to his village, put him into bed. And then we went up to stay with friends in the mountain Pine Ridge about 40 minutes away. In the middle of the night, this dream occurred and I see Don Eligio lying on the floor next to our bed. And he's old, old wrinkled Don Eligio panting and taking his last breaths. And finally he takes in a big sigh and I know that he's passed away. And then Don Eligio stands up, a young man, black hair, no wrinkles on his face. And he sits down on the bed next to me and I could feel the bed depress when he sat down. He put his arms around me, gave me a hug and a kiss. And he said, I love you, Rosita. And I said, I love you, Don Eligio. And then with his hand, he pointed to a corner of the room. In the corner of the room, sitting on a wooden stool, was a boy I know to be Gonzalo, about 10 years old. Gonzalo's face changed to Maria. Maria's face changed to Jose. And Jose's face changed to Lydia, all children. 
Don Eligio said, take the children as if they were your own. Train them and teach them to help each other. So that is our, our motto. That is our philosophy of Bush Medicine Camp. Those were my march, marching orders, if you will. I spent two years thinking about that. My husband, Greg, and I came up with this idea of having a summer camp based exclusively on learning how to use medicinal plants and also on traditional healing. So here you see the children learning how to treat a sprained ankle with the obel leaf, which is from the Piperaceae family. Same family as black pepper. It's a very aromatic leaf. We crush it, tie it up around the sprain, and uh, it takes away the recovery period. Uh, instead of 10 days, you're up and walking about in three days. Obviously, it's not an instant cure, but uh, they certainly loved tying this leaf around each other's foot. Okay, next one. We also teach them foot massage. Somebody requested that they learn how to do a foot bath and a foot massage. And I thought, children, children aren't going to enjoy that. I don't think it's going to work, but I'll do it. Well, immediately after the first foot massage, which lasts about 10 minutes, the children all started banging on the table. We want more, we want more. So it has been a part of a summer bush medicine camp ever since about 2005 when it was first introduced and uh, they sit across from each other. First, they bathe each other's feet in, floor, in floral water that they collect with prayer. And then um, they dry each other's foot with the towel. And then we have six or seven little moves that we teach them and then they switch. And it's, it's quite astounding how it is so uh, settling and centering and relaxing for the children and how much they enjoy doing it. One of the things we learned in Bush Medicine Camp is that children want to be helpful. They want to help each other and they want to help their parents. So one of our favorite things, we usually have 24 children in Bush Medicine Camp and 10 teenage counselors. The two young men you see there are high school students who are beyond thrilled to have a summer employment to help them buy school books and buy their uniforms. Okay, next. And making herbal poultice for headaches with hibiscus flowers. You can imagine this is one of their favorite things to do. So I have to have all of these scraps of cloth ready to go and available for this aspect of summer bush medicine camp. And lo and behold, this is one, like the foot massage, this is one of the things we teach them that really, really sticks. This little boy in particular has two uh, parents, a mother and a father who work all day long in the marketplace. And uh, after this Bush Medicine Camp in 2018, I walked by his mother's stall and said, how is your son? Did he really enjoy himself? And she said, oh, Rosita, what you taught him to do with those hibiscus leaves for a headache, he does that for me all the time as soon as I get home. And that foot massage, oh, what a difference that has made to our lives. I stand on my feet 12, 14 hours a day. And as soon as we get home, my son has my foot basin ready. And if I have a headache, he knows exactly what to do. So you see how traditions can become forever. And that, of course, has always been my goal, that I could learn it, I could archive it, and I could pass it on as much and as fast as possible. The little uh, quilt you see behind you is done by every Bush Medicine Camp group every year. Each child gets a 9 by, not 9 by 12 piece of muslin cloth to decorate in any way that they want, and then we sew them all together. All right, the next one. And tree planting, of course, is an important part of Bush Medicine Camp, and it is so meaningful to the children as well. And they come back, because we like to plant them around the town, not outside in the bush. I, I like these fruit trees. This is a 
a mango tree. I like the fruit trees to be planted inside the town of San Ignacio or Santa Elena. And uh, this one was planted in at my next door neighbor's house. And three girls who planted that often stop in to say hello to me in Santa Elena because we come for check on the mango tree. Miss Rosita, I think it needs water. I could get a bucket of water, please, for we tree. So they care about the tree, they love it, they look after it. And so it's teaching responsibility, but it's also teaching a love to support nature in its growth. So I can't tell you how meaningful the, um, the donations are to the people and the children of Belize that come in from the abdominal therapy classes. Next one. Grow to Learn Garden from Ischel Foundation in memory of Don Eligio Panti is in the Santa Elena Primary School. And uh, I just thought that it was very important that it not only be a two weeks in the summertime, but children at least in one school to see this was a pilot project to see how it would go, how long it would last, that they would be able to uh, every day be in contact with the medicinal plants. The next slide. Here they are in the very, very early days of this little garden plot and they are transplanting. You see the little red cup has a thyme plant in it. So we planted oregano and thyme, uh, basil, all of the plants that are common because they had to be common and really tough plants that will survive all manner of treatment, lack of treatment, or even mistreatment. And so we chose the, um, the nopal, prickly pear, and all other culinary herbs, and culantro, and cilantro, and so that the children could come out every day and pick and take home what they need. Next. And our ethnobotany in the classroom has been going uh, since 2012. However, this year, no, because the schools were closed for a long time because of COVID. So I'm hoping that this will begin again coming in September of 2021. So uh, we have a, a woman who is a mother of four children that was one of the directors at Summer Bush Medicine Camp. And so she said that um, she could really use more work during the rest of the year. And I came up with this project, take bringing the medicinal plants that we share at Bush Medicine Camp into a classroom. This is about fifth grade. And uh, she set it all up with the school. I simply, you, fund it. She gets a regular salary for doing six ethnobotany classes in the same Santa Elena school where the, the garden is and been very, very well received. It's in the social studies division of the class. Children love it. And I, one of the things we are so impressed with is how much the kids already know. If we hold up a rose, a red rose, and we say, anybody know how this is used in medicine? Usually 10 hands fly up into the air. They already know how to use oregano. They know a lot about the hibiscus because their mothers and their grandmothers are still using these common everyday plants for household, household plants for household ailments is what we teach in this ethnobotany. Next. And basically our last slide, this is our home here in Belize. That's my doorway where you walk into if you come for a class in Belize. And this is the setup for our copal burners for teaching the week-long spiritual healing class. This is my front yard, the one there on the far right-hand side, overlooking the Maya mountains. Below on the far left is a, um, a glass sculpture that my brother did just before he passed away as a gift. So it's very meaningful to me. And the Rainforest Medicine Trail at East Chell Farm was established in 1985. After I met Don Eligio, I thought, my goodness, the whole country should have access to this knowledge. And I thought one of the best ways to do it would be to show them the plant 
in its natural setting. Live herbs, live trees, live bushes, live uh, skunk root. So Don Eligio came to our farm, the old East Chow farm, alongside the Macau River, and he helped me lay out a trail through the 32 acres of jungle that we had just purchased on cleared land. And he identified 10 or 12 medicinal plants by tying little ribbons around them. And then uh, we hired someone to clear a trail through the forest. We had to build several areas of steps. And we had 10,000 people a year come to the Rainforest Medicine Trail and 2,000 of those were school children from the local schools close to where we live. This piece of land is now owned by my neighbors at Chalk Creek Lodge, who are taking very good care, stewarding the medicine trail and looking after that uh, little piece of uh, forest that we cleared and lived on for 22 years before we moved up to the house on the far left. And there's a chair where someone has just vacated after a spiritual bath. So, all right, next one. And today I wish you all the blessings in the world. I'm going to end with singing the song. Tierra mi cuerpo, agua mi sangre, <coughs> gre, viento mi aire. Fuego mi espíritu. The earth is my body. The water is my blood. The wind is my breath. And fire is my spirit. Now, I just want to finally close by saying, for many, many years, this song that came to us from Peru, I always thought this was referring to us that our body is the earth and our water is the blood. However, I think this is a direct message now from the goddess herself, that her physical body is Gaia, the earth. Her blood is the water that runs on this earth and her very own breath is the wind. And wherever there is fire, that is the spirit of the goddess. And this beautiful tree is right at uh, the Chalk Creek campsite, where many of you have stayed when you came to workshops at Old East Chell and also up at the Villa Rosa. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure. I love this. 